Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another night of Disney Dialogues. I'm here with my broadcasting partner, Monora Molly. Hello, Jen. Good evening. Hello. This is going to be a fun interview. I'm excited. We've been waiting for this one for quite a bit. Uh, it's a chance for us to sit down with another incredible uh, person who's made an impression through the Disney, through the magic they've done behind the scenes, and we're going to bring that up front tonight. I know you've been looking forward to this one yourself. Yeah, this one is one that we've had on the books for a while. Um, leading up to it, had a lot of time to do some research, um, come up with some really good questions, and I'm I'm really looking forward to the stories that we're going to hear tonight. It's going to be a fun time. We're gonna we're gonna talk about not only Disney with our guests, but outside of Disney, uh, their life in general, and celebrate some of that tonight. Uh, the stories are going to be flowing, so I ask everybody to sit back, find your favorite beverage, whatever whether it's water, wine, whiskey, or the best and uh, enjoy yourself tonight. We will try to get to as many of the uh, questions that we can in the chat. We will acknowledge all of the chat being here and thank everybody for coming in. However, we want to maximize the time with our guests. So uh, if we don't get to your question, <clears throat> please know that we saw it and we want to make sure that you remind you that at the end of the show, you can go back in and put your question into the comment section of the video. And uh, I personally will go in, pull those and ask our guests, to make sure to get those questions and get an answer back and and reply to all of them. So no question will go unnoticed tonight as we go through. Uh, we're excited. Let's get things going. It's Disney Dialogues tonight with John DeCure. Jen, would you be so kind just to introduce our guest? Absolutely. <clears throat> Been looking forward to this. It is our honor tonight to have Disney Dialogues with a USC graduate that has taken his college studies to legendary success in his field. Art direction and production design can be seen across multiple movie genres, including drama, comedy, action, and horror. He owns them all. Yes, he does. His movie resume includes Ghostbusters, Fright Night, Top Gun, Turner and Hooch, and Sister Act 2, just to name a few. In Disney, he rubs shoulders with iconic names like Hench, Scalar, and Gurr. Wow. Mirroring their iconic magic. Yeah, those are some names, aren't they? Yes. In his years working at Disney, he was credited as project designer on the master plan for Walt Disney's Epcot and World Showcase. He was project designer for Spaceship Earth and the original Communicore. Wow. His name is synonymous with the Contemporary and Polynesian Resorts, Muppet Vision 3D, an alien encounter, just to name a few. Please welcome to the show a man whom by the end of the night you will realize helped make Epcot go from dream to reality. Please say hello to Epcot Center concept designer, John DeCure. Hello, John. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for that gracious uh, introduction. Absolutely. Jen did, a, Jen did an amazing job with that. We're excited. I, I got goosebumps again with just her reading off the uh, the interview right there. We're going to have a great time tonight. Uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, but in our chat, John, we, uh, we have emojis for our members of our channel. And there is a special one dedicated to you tonight. There is a Spaceship Earth emoji that our members will be dropping in the chat in your honor tonight as they go through. Uh, I also asked my friends tonight that are watching all of our uh, guests this evening, make sure you hit the like on this video. Let's get up over a hundred likes. That's my look at they're lighting up that, that chat right now with, with an honor emoji to you. So I love that. Uh, as we get started tonight, we're going to go through, we welcome you to, uh, engage with our chat, tell us your stories, and we look forward to just hearing everything about you and what you've done. Uh, tonight I'm excited to look into your world of Disney, uh, theatrical movies and the impact of the millions that you have impacted around the globe through all of your uh, your art. However, prior to this deep dive, I want to start off simple. I want to be kind enough if we just do a general introduction for us of you, and then we'll talk all about Disney movies and beyond as we get through. So just a second, a little introduction for somebody who might not know you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, primarily and at my core, I've always been a, a designer. I think we're all designers. We all make choices about how to do things in life. But in particular, production design, working in film, television, a little bit of theater, and of course, the attraction industry. And that uh, the idea of, of taking, as you graciously noted, I, I learned a lot at my uh, 
college years at USC. But I also thought uh, just working on in, in the studio system in the art departments and back lots. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a lot of scholastic opportunity to learn about those worlds. You had to go out and actually work in them. Mm -hmm. And following in my father's footsteps, I was able to access all of that uh, that kind of behind the uh, the walls of, of the studios where all that magic was created. And uh, I did study uh, to become an architect, but uh, somehow the uh, the real world was not quite as fascinating as the as the fictional world of storytelling. <laughs> and so, and, and Wed Wed became you know became a wonderful place where I could marry my architectural skills with storytelling skills. So uh, there you are. That's I, kind of uh, that's kind of a little intro to. to I love it. That's perfect. Before I, yeah. I turn it over to Jen, because I know she's chomping at the bit to go, uh, I do want to acknowledge a couple of things. One, I want to thank all, all of the people in the chat, but I also want to uh, say thank you to Spaceship Ears. We've acknowledged it throughout the time that uh, Spaceship yeah. Ears is your son, John, and he was kind enough uh, you know, being part of our community to uh, hook you, hook us up together. And I am so excited. Much love out to John uh, tonight here <laughs> for, for doing that. Jen, how about if we get going and start talking about the career of this amazing individual? Well, I want to go back all the way to the beginning. So can you share with us how you began at WED and your early days with the Disney company? Okay, I'll even push you back a little further, if I may. Yeah, okay. Uh, because uh, I wouldn't have been at WED had I not spent uh, my very young youth growing up at the Fox Art Department in 20th Century Fox oh. uh, and worked as an apprentice and a blueprint boy. Uh, and, and those were in the early 50s and, and uh, or post 50s. And I had an opportunity during those years to meet with Dick Irvine, who, who was instrumental in, in the early Disneyland plans and development, and, and uh, Marvin Davis and Bill Martin. And so I had no idea when I was a youth that I would end up working for these gentlemen. In fact, when I came, I, I uh, finished college and, and went into the Coast Guard and we had that uh, that uh, issue of Vietnam we had to resolve. And right. When I came out, I uh, I was looking for a job, and, and I found a little ad in the newspaper, and it said, uh, graphic artist wanted. And it had these strange initials on the top of it, W-E-D, you know? And uh, I had been gone for a few years, and I had made no connection between the, the people that I knew uh, back at Fox and, and Wed. And uh, as a consequence, uh, the fellow that interviewed me, you know, hired me, and he, but he called back 24 hours later and he said, why didn't you tell me you knew the president of this company? <laughs> <laughs> he said, bring all your drawings back in. They all want to talk to you. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's kind of how my, my intro at, at, at WED was. And, uh, they, they were wonderful people and they really understood the, the world of, of imagineering, of bringing ideas from out of your imagination and into the real world. So that's how I began it with. Love that. Wow. Love that. On, on awesome. behalf of a uh, Coast Guard family right there on the screen with wow. us, uh, on behalf of that, I say, I say thank you. <laughs> thank you for your service uh, to our country. Uh, thank you John. very much. You. What a tragedy, though, today. Our boys are busy in that, in that bridge incident, huh? They are. They're very busy here, and uh, we're uh, we're blessed. Uh, my time that I spent with the military, I worked down uh, at the Coast Guard unit down there. So uh, mm -hmm. I know many of them that are out there working right now, and God bless them. So uh, for that, yeah. uh, good the, boys. They, uh, so much. So <clears throat> the term Imagineering. I tell you what, I'd like to talk about that for a second. Is one that receives reverence from Disney purist fans and uh, those that are following everything in the Disney story. Can you elaborate on what this term means to you and what you feel is the at the heart of the creative process? Well, I think, you know, the, the whole idea of moving a, an idea, a mental image of an idea from mind to matter is kind of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of conceiving a world uh, writers talk about world building all the time. I think production designers should be talking more about world building. In other words, building the narrative environments that that support the storytelling process. And uh, the the idea that that these worlds are fictional and they're fantasized and they're imagined 
And yet, somehow we've got to transpose those ideas, take them out, put them on a piece of paper, and eventually build them, whether it's in a movie set or mm -hmm. even more excitingly, it's, it's in a, a theme park where the, the actors become the audience and your audience can actually walk through that environment. So that process of imagineering, of taking a, a, an idea and, and bringing it into reality. And one thing that I learned, uh, I noticed and learned at, at, at WED was that there was a great deal of more emphasis put on modeling the idea. That's one thing that WED did to, to, to a, a excellent extent, I felt, is that they modeled a, an idea in, in fully, as fully as they can. Now, in my period, this was all pre-computer. Right. So, of course, it was cardboard and, and scissors and, and exacto blades. And today, now we have the luxury of doing all that, you know, in, in digitally. Uh, but modeling the idea, you know, there was a little phrase that used to go around like, you know, it's a lot easier to pick up an eraser than a jackhammer. Uh, hmm. And so, if you, if you model the idea and study it carefully, uh, then you can eliminate and, and, and improve upon the idea. There's a recycling process that goes on between the mental image and the model. Now, in some instances, we can broadly determine a sketch okay. as a model. You know, you're modeling the idea, even though it's not a physical model. Uh, so that cycling process of sketching back to the mental imagining of the idea and recycling that over and over again until the idea becomes uh, uh, significant and consequential and and in a kind of a low risk environment, you've avoided making some big mistakes. And that last picture you just put up there with John Hench at the top, uh, you know, John was the, I used to call him the detective of contradictions. And that was his <laughs> phrase. He, he said, if we can just eliminate the contradictions, you know, in our work. Uh, and he used to like to say that, uh, uh, be careful of even the smallest contradiction. Right. Because sometimes you miss a lot of other kinds of this. That one contradiction could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know? Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that you, can't, you, you can't afford, you really can't afford to, to skip over those contradictions. You have to fix them. You have to design your way through them. And, 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 and so the modeling process at WED was major, uh, major uh, contribution, I think, to taking these ideas, these ideas, taking up many other designers' ideas and manifesting them in a way they could be analyzed and, and then and then move through the, the more normal process of construction and documents and, and getting things built. But so important to make, to correct your mistakes in that low risk early modeling environment. So Imagineering to me is, is, a, is a, 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 a wonderful way of, of taking dreams and bringing them to life. I love that. Uh, real quick before Jen goes, because she's got a great question coming up here. I have to ask one question. Mm -hmm. This just came to mind, Jen, and I don't know how it didn't come to mind when, when we were putting this together. I, I have to ask you, John, when, when you were at there and you were working with WED and you had mm -hmm. all of these individuals as talented as you and uh, around you, did you guys know how much of an impact, how big of a role you were going to play in this whole scheme of Disney? I don't think I did. Uh, I think John Hench did. John was an amazing guy and he had, he had a perspective. <clears throat> I remember him saying one day, you know, at well, least our theme parks are going to be built all around the world. Uh, well, now we take that for granted because they have been built. But at that time that was kind of a, you know, an interesting uh, prognosis or prediction. And, uh, See, I think John understood what was happening there in terms of the bigger picture. Um, and he wanted to approach Epcot very carefully. Uh, I remember when I first went to work there, he, actually not first, but the, my second, I had two episodes at went. Right. And in the second one where they, where they invited me to come in and, and work on Epcot, he was committed to the World Showcase as the next step to moving to Epcot. And not necessarily the two together, but I, I, I digress. I think we'll talk about that a little later. We, we definitely will. Sorry, I just I, I was overcome with that as you were talking about mm -hmm. WED and everything. Jen, I apologize for going on strip. Go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper um, into concepts and ideas that you had during your extensive career with WED. What was your most challenging idea concept? that you brought to the generation modeling and development? 
Mm, good question. I think, uh, well, I, I worked on some fun projects. I mean, I, uh, uh, I, st I worked on the Hall of Presidents and I worked on uh, the, uh, actually the, the little post show on, on the Space Mountain, you know, Space I had the Mountain. opportunity to, you know, to make that first illustration before we knew what that was. And, uh, uh, but I, 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 I have to say, of course, that, uh, that Epcot and Communicore were the, you know, were the most challenging in that, in that process. And uh, following up on Walt's dream about this experimental community of tomorrow, uh, boy, you talk about a challenge. That was the challenge times 10, because it was conceived at, at a moment in, in time when, uh, you know, this, this pre-computer world we were just on the edge of getting into all of that uh, and the idea that that you could build uh, prototypes of ways to live in the better hospital and the better airport and and the problem being that the technology was advancing so rapidly geometrically that by the time you poured the concrete the concept was obsolete almost i'm exaggerating a bit but that was the danger you know, to build the brick and mortar community. Uh, by the time you got even close to being finished, new ideas would have popped up and, 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 and there, there was really no way to achieve that in a physical way. That's when, and that's, that's when John and Ray Bradbury and I began banging around the idea of what's, what is there, how can we model this idea? How can we model these new ideas in a way that people can look at them, can learn from them, uh, but that they're not obsolete the minute they get built. And uh, that was the struggle. That was a challenge. And, and, and that's sort of what we were dedicating Communicore to, to try to wrestle that to the ground, uh, that idea. How do, we, how, do we, how do we demonstrate? And we had no idea that, that in the next 50, 75 years, we'd be able to build these worlds virtually and walk into them. Right. Yeah. Because so, yeah, we were still working, I believe, uh, Spaceship Ears here was still working on his Atari. <laughs> but you were doing that. Absolutely. That's, that's um, impressive. That was the challenging part. And, and, and I think that, uh, I think we laid some good groundwork. I don't think we solved the problem completely, uh, but, uh, but that was, that was my challenging moment. Yes. Yeah, so. I love it. I love it. We've had, uh, we've had 50 to 60 people consistently coming in today and uh, through our community and so many great people, a lot of great comments in the chat already, John. Uh, about you, Julie McCowan says John DeCure is th is a thought leader for sure. Uh, Winks mm -hmm. Wild Ride said John rubbed elbows with the best of them. Uh, I saw many a uh, great comments in here. Uh, Julie also said earlier, "I'm feeling smarter already." Just listening, which is uh, great. I love that comment there. Uh, Tim Rempel says, "I would love to build models for Disney. A dream job for sure." A lot of great friends in here. Please keep putting your comments in, and we will talk. Uh, try to get as many of those up or acknowledged in as we go through. Jen, that was a great question. I want to shift mm -hmm. transition to a little bit uh, around, and we are going to bounce around uh, John's career as we go through here to try to get a good total perception of the man himself. John, you, you taught at UCLA Performing Arts Program and USC School of Cinema in the graduate program, both incredibly respected institutions. Both both of them have cost me money in the basketball. I just want to point that out as well. Uh, can you open up <laughs> on the importance uh, to me of sharing your knowledge for those who come behind you and what it means to you personally to do it at two iconic colleges? I would love to hear about that. Well, thank you. I, I also have to add the American Film Institute into that list. Uh, I taught there for several years. Wow. And then okay. my, my current online university, Asbury, which I'm very proud of. But to answer your question, uh, I think I, I entered this whole arena of education somewhat differently than many of my peers. I had this tremendous support team, uh, you know, not only my father, but all my father's peers. Uh, and I started to explain earlier that uh, in working at the Fox Art Department as, a, as an apprentice, as a blueprint boy, uh, they were a group of people that were so anxious to pass on what they knew, their knowledge, their experience, uh, that uh, I picked all that up and I absorbed all of that. Uh, and that was a wonderful world, that studio environment. It had problems, certainly. Uh, but it put together these teams of people. And I had access to that. I had access to 
to uh, not so much academic teachers, because these guys were in the field making it all happen, but they were anxious to pass their knowledge on. They, they, were, they, were, they were very concerned that, 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 that they had learned something and they wanted to pass it along. And I became sort of the, I guess, the, the art department mascot. You know, it occurred to me later in my life that I looked around and taught in these schools you're talking about, fine schools, fine institutions. But there really wasn't, I didn't feel, the emphasis on production design uh, oh. academically across the board, not picking on any one school, just generally across the board. And so I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to pay forward and to take some of the things that I learned that, that are not in, in, in the how-to books uh, and, and try to pass, pass that along. And so that's, that was, that's why I've, I've been dedicating the last 10 years of my life and probably to the end of my life really focusing on teaching. And and, uh, and and trying to pass those ideas forward, pay forward. I think that's that's absolutely awesome. Make sure everybody, again, you're hitting the like tonight on this interview. Make sure you're dropping your comments in. I saw BitRitz is in. Hello, BitRitz says, hey, everyone, I have to run to the store, but I, this, I'm this i so excited for this. Epcot is my favorite, which I love <clears> seeing that. Uh, moderators are dropping links in for, uh, you know, John's social media aspects so you can find them. They're also pinned in the description of this video as well. And I'll also remind you if you're brand new, please make sure hit that subscribe, whether you're watching live or on the replay, uh, look for more amazing interviews, uh, with people of John's stature and more coming from Jen and I on Tuesday nights. Jen, where are we going from here? I want to go back to the creation of Spaceship Earth and Epcot as a whole. Okay. Uh, I, I was curious, how much um, did the World's Fair play into Walt's initial vision and the whole evolution of Epcot? I, not so, well, the World's Fair is, of course, uh, this whole idea of Walt moving from Disneyland, you know, to Epcot. Uh, started and and started with his in fact even in disneyland started uh with his experiences in the world's fairs the carousel of progress and mm -hmm. and uh, the small small world and all of those were uh, birthed out of the, the the new york world's fair uh and then uh when we came around to trying to deliver on uh, what is epcot and 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 the notion of it as not really a world's fair, you know, something different, something special, but in that genre, you know, in that category. And, and most world's fairs throughout history have had these major icons to represent their moment in time, uh, the Eiffel Tower, so to speak. And, and I took a close look at the 1939 world's fair and the Paris sphere. That was a big sphere in, in the 39th right. fair. What was interesting about it was what was inside the sphere, which I thought very appropriate based on, on, on where Walt wanted this project to go, is that you look down upon a city of tomorrow. And it was a model of the city of tomorrow, and you got to walk, walk around the, the Paris sphere. That's about when uh, uh, Bradbury came in, Ray Bradbury came in, and, and, and Marty put us all in a box, and we started uh, dealing with, well, what's going to be in our sphere? And... Uh, and it was just notions of it being a sphere at that time. We really hadn't had nailed it down. And, and that's just when Ray began to, to talk about communications and the history of communications. And uh, this trek, uh, I, I call it today, the, from the cave wall to the holodeck. Uh, at that time, it was sort of from the cave wall to space. Um, and uh, so that became the theme. That became the, the story that we poured into the sphere. And about that same time, uh, because the sphere led us to the whole notion of a geodesic dome and bucky fuller came into the picture in terms of his i think fabulous metaphor of spaceship right. earth spaceship earth right yeah and so that's that metaphor bucky fuller's metaphor of spaceship earth bradbury's story about from the cave wall to space uh and all of that came together in a way that that we were searching for what is our eiffel tower you know what is our icon and that became the big sphere sitting sitting there today Love it, love it, love it. Also want to point out in the chat that Annette is here. And uh, while you might not remember because you meet a lot of people, Annette was very excited to have met you uh, recently. 
Uh, I think that was at Retro Magic. She said she met you in the chat. Yes. So she's very excited to see you again. So uh, a lot of people coming in saying some amazing things. I love it. Uh, John, 1991. I'm sorry. No, I was just thinking in it, I'm waving. There you go. Thank you. Uh, 1991 found you working production design for Muppet Vision 3D, one of my favorites in the park. I absolutely love that that show. At the time, a revolutionary experience combining animation, puppetry, and the 3D element. Can you share with our audience the insight into bringing this encounter to life for us? Sure. I'll give it a try. First of all, you know, working for a genius is not a bad job. And, and Henson was clearly that. Jim was a wonderful guy and, and brilliant. Uh, and this, oops. I'm sorry. I think I, something's popped up on my screen. Anyway, <laughs> lost my screen, but I've lost my screen, but I'll continue to talk. We'll blame that on uh, your son. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but talking about Jim. Uh, and what interested me and he, and we had long conversations about this in the project, was the idea of audience uh, immersion. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, we could bring together the, the 3D technology would sort of pull the imagery off the screen and into the audience. And then we had the animated figures in the balconies. And th this, I think, was a kind of a, a, a wonderful opportunity to touch on this idea of where we are headed. I mean, right. I think Walt, you know, Walt's, one of Walt's great moments and, and genius was pouring his audience into the environment, into the story. Uh, up until that time, we'd all been attracted in, uh, by looking at these flat silver screens, and we worked really hard to create illusions on the flat silver screen that would pull us in. But but Walt, you know, dramatically in the 50s, you know, said, no, 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 I'm going to put my audience right in, into the story. Into the story, and right. Disney. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that was to take one show and to start working with those various elements, the 3D element, the animation, uh, having the characters come out. I'm going to talk about all kinds of things and, and run through the audience. But that was exciting. It was exciting to begin moving in that direction of, furthering this audience immersion uh, idea so absolutely absolutely love it and to work with henson um again adding another name to your illustrious resume of incredible people that you have worked with uh, i'm always blown away uh especially in times like this uh jen i know you want to talk about something that i think is extremely important to john and that's some pillars of design if i remember correctly yeah, I, w I wanted to talk a little bit about the five pillars of design. Um, we know they're critical elements that a production designer uses to create the narrative environment of a film. Um, do, can you share these five and, and top line the importance of them? I can, yes, I can talk about that. The, uh, I think the important part is to begin to say that, that my father always felt that there should be a book. You know, it should be a big, fat, thick book on production design. And there are a lot of good, don't get me wrong, a lot of good books out there on production design. But he was more interested in, in metrics than in how-to. He was more interested in measuring, you know, measuring a good design. How do you do that? How do you go about putting a yardstick on, on whether the environment, the narrative, the world-building narrative environment that you're creating, whether it's for a movie or a theme park or at all, uh, is, is, as John Hinch would say, is a good show? Or a bad show. Yeah. How do you measure that? And that's what these pillars are all about. We've been trying to to codify that in a way and put it in a book. And, and certainly we're doing it in my class. Uh, and there in general, I won't get into it. It's, it's very lengthy. But generally speaking, uh, it starts with the narrative parody. You know, that's the, the first pillar. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We can decide whether going into the others are, are uh, of merit tonight. But narrative parody is is an idea that actually came from Walt, at least from stories I heard about Walt. Right. Uh, one being that uh, he would say, don't bring me an idea unless this, this idea is in balance. Let's talk about the protagonist, the triangle, right. protagonist, antagonist, heroes, villains. Huh? Uh, let's talk about the mission. What are they on? What's the mission that they're trying to accomplish? And then third, let's on the third side of the triangle, let's talk about the uh, narrative environment, the world that they're playing out the story in. 
And if you can't really talk to me about why those are strong, powerful elements, go and figure it out and come back later. <laughs> All right. And so he wanted, and I think I think it's 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 if you ask yourself why sometimes you get into a movie and you you stop watching it, you know, you go to the kitchen or something. One of the sides of those triangles, it, it's probably not working. You know, it probably hasn't been thought out correctly. Again, protagonist, mission, and the world, the narrative environment that you're building. And so keeping those in balance, keeping those strong and powerful, uh, I think is one of the first responsibilities of a production designer is, is to make sure. Now, the production designer represents that third leg. He represents right. building the world that the actors are going to play in and, and play out their missions in. And if that world is a weak world, you stop believing, you know, or if the protagonists are weak, you stop believing in the story. So that's just one example of, of one of the pillars of, uh, of design that we're, we're working with. I love it. I, I there love are other it. I love that you went to that one. Just real quick, Jen, that is a great question. And that you went to that one because I read about that with Walt being uh, an emphatic thing that he brought to all his Imagineers and all the people around him that he wanted that triangle of the storytelling thing. Uh, and there was uh, actually someone that said, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it, it, it kind of made sense when we were watching some of the new Marvel stuff that came out. There was an, a little bit of an Easter egg to Walt that Tony Stark in his Iron Man thing, his first initial one that he put for, into his chest was a triangle. That was a mm. tribute. So yeah, don't that's know, good. Yeah. thought that was kind of an interest. I love that you, you brought that up. I, and I think there's, we could spend a whole evening with you just talking about some of these pillars and maybe that's a later date where we could sit down with you at another time and, and talk about a lot that more in depth. Uh, Cause your, your knowledge is emphatic on that. Um, just to, just to ask yourself the next time you're watching a show and it's not quite working for you, don't stop there. Ask yourself which sides of those, which one of those sides of the triangle is weak and, and needed, needed reinforcement. Uh, and, and I think we begin to appreciate, you know, good show, bad show, bringing yeah. back John Lynch again. Uh, and so the, the narrative parity balance is one part of that good show, bad show equation, the metrics of how do we measure, uh, and not, not just how do we go and build a set or pound a nail, um, but how do we decide that the, the, the package we're putting together really is going to result in a, in a great show, a good, a, good, a good world for our actors to act in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's jump back nice. to Epcot World Showcase uh, again. Oh. Uh, you know, that's evolved into almost a Disney must-do experience. I know it is for me and many others that go to Disney now. It used to be years ago all about MK and but I really think that Epcot has emerged as a must do place. Can you tell me about the thoughts for Epcot initially as the project started and kind of share a little insight into your experience from working with Marty Scalar and John Hench back in 1976 when, you know, that future world theme center and world showcase concepts kind of merged into a single location. Hmm. Yes. The, uh, well, when I first went to work for WED, I went to work with, for Marvin Davis. Marvin Davis was one of the original Fox art directors that came to, uh, you know, that Walt put his team together with Dick Irvine and, uh, and many of the Claude Coates. And they were basically film people. And then he put those p people together with his animators and created, you know, created the first WED. Uh, and the, the notion that, uh, uh, that John Hench brought to the table when I came in was he was very, very uh, focused on this world showcase concept. Mm -hmm. The idea of, uh, of gathering nations of the world to come together and to celebrate their culture and their, their, their experiences. In those days, people didn't travel quite as much as they do today. So the idea of going to Europe was not just something you jumped on the plane and did twice a year. Uh, and so World Showcase, World Showcase made a lot of sense. I still think it makes a lot of sense and maybe a different scale in, in cities around the world. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, so <laughs> when I walked in the door, that's, uh, that was the focus. We were going to build World Showcase. And John Hinch patted me on the head several times and said, relax, John, you got 10, 15 years before anybody's worried about Epcot. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be, I believe even it was going to be located up around the Polynesian Hotel when, when I first walked in the door. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, 
as time went by and as the project developed, um, the uh, uh, the marketing and financing pressures grew as uh, as because these countries of the world uh, really uh, were not uh, what is, what's the phrase they weren't uh, uh, waving their checkbooks in anger you know at the project uh, and uh, the company wanted at least a fifty percent participation from outs not just put our own money into you know into it. And, and at that same time, Epcot was emerging, and uh, we were building models and dreaming about it, and, and it received a lot more positive corporate response financial. And that, at that moment, it was decided that we've got to bring the two projects on at the same time. So my 15 years went out the window, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody got very serious about Epcot. Uh, and that's when the, that's when the two worlds came together. I uh, I had some fun and I pulled out a file. This is one of the early sketches behind me, and uh, because I think it was uh, well, I know it was that uh, Marty had asked uh, uh, Wing Chow and I. Wing was a part of Wing. the whole master planning right. effort, mm -hmm. and he locked us in a room and said, "Okay, you know, you guys start talking about how these two animals, pardon me, come together," and. Uh, we actually had had a couple of solutions that were quite interesting where the uh, uh, the pavilions of the world gathered around Communicore to sort of celebrate, you know, these new ideas that were coming up. Uh, but the, the practicality of things were such at the time that the World Showcase had so many uh, practical feet in the ground in terms of working drawings and, and, and things that have just that that, that complete mer merger of the two worlds. Uh, uh, just wasn't physically financially possible at the time, and so they just approached each other as in the current solution. So, and, uh, as a as a quick follow up, again, Jen's going to love me because I'm going off script all night tonight. Uh, as a quick follow up, I have to ask now because it just came to me, John. We're we're sitting here, and and you were there when infancy was starting for Epcot. Birth was starting for Epcot. As you look at it today, are you pleased with where it? went to from when you started i would my i, I would like to rephrase the question because please presumes it's finished and i don't Ooh. think it'll ever be finished okay i like yeah. it yeah i wouldn't be i went there last time in the retro experience and i saw fences going up and buildings coming down and and uh you know i'm in no position having been away from from uh, the inner workings of, of wdi for all these years but i'm sure they're 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 thinking about about this whole issue of of this ex, you know experimental prototype community of tomorrow right. i remember john Hens, i remember john hench used to say he was really concerned about branding uh -huh. and how we market that idea and he was a, kind of afraid that people would think that epcot was was some kind of a, a technological fruit like an apricot you know and because <laughs> the, those three letters didn't really sell very well <laughs> right as to what it was i love it I so, love it. No, I, just to answer your original question, I, I think Epcot, I hope and pray that Epcot is never finished and that it will evolve. And I think that when you see the, the amazing things we can do today and the amazing power that the Disney organization has, I wouldn't be surprised as to how Epcot evolves into something really, really exciting in the years to come. I love it. That is a fantastic. I, I almost felt like I was you were channeling Walt for a second as I was sitting there listening. <laughs> I kind of got lost in your words for a second. Uh, well, it all goes back to that notion of a brick and mortar community. But now that we're sitting on the edge of a, a, a digital world and virtual reality, we don't have to build a brick and mortar community. We can create it. And I, we talked earlier about how wonderful it was that we had modeled these things. Well, now we can model things and you can actually walk through it. Put your headset on and walk through it. Walk and I think the head. headset is just temporary too. We're going to get over that pretty quickly, just like we did the 3D glasses. But yes, anyway. it'll be a Tony Stark world very shortly, I'm sure. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> well, before I go over to Jen, Wendy B said hello to everyone. I won't tag to keep the chat clean, but I'm so excited to see this interview. Uh, so she wanted to say hello to everybody. Uh, I also saw there's a nice comment by David T. Every time I look at the spaceship Earth, it brings me to tears. Happy tears. It makes me feel magical. I couldn't have said that better. It's a great, great um, mm -hmm. a testament to, to John and, and the others who have put in with him to make it happen. Jen, where are we going now? 
Well, we're going to go a little bit off script. You went off script. I'm going to go a little bit off script. Okay. I don't know if, if anybody else picked up on this, but my ears perked up when, when you said, was Epcot supposed to be by the Polynesian? Is that what you had said, that originally it was going to be by the Poly? The very early plans, because, of course, at that time, they hadn't made a commitment to break ground on Epcot. Uh, and, but but the, the forces at work at that time wanted to build World Showcase first. And it needed a home, and it wasn't in its current location. But there were some areas being examined up around the Polynesian Hotel and that that big lagoon there to develop wow. it. And they didn't they didn't live too long, uh, but uh, but that was the early thinking. Yeah, cool. Wow. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool. You know, didn't right. didn't know that. <laughs> um, well, that I wanted. Um, kind of cool. We have to give a little credit here too. Also, speaking of uh, credit. Uh, Harper Goff uh, was uh, instrumental in World Showcase because when I first came there, the World Showcase was a very contemporary facade. They were they were they were very sleek and graphic and, and uh, almost airport like, uh, and uh, so you could travel, so to speak, to the different countries, you know, like you were getting going to the airport. Uh, and Harper came in and he started noodling, being the production designer of Merit that he was. Uh, and he was the one that added these fabulous facades, themed facades to the, to the, the front of, of, of World Showcase. And so uh, we have to give, tip our hats to, to Harper for doing such a great job and contributing that, that new look. Uh, to the idea, he has ideas, you know, within WED were always evolving and always emerging. And there was a point in time when we were trying to get everybody that went into the park through Spaceship Earth first. Well, you, you know, the calculations on that were astronomical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So things things evolved, things changed in, in a good way. And, love it, love it, love it. I wanted to um, touch. That's what, you get, quick... that's, what, that's what you get for going off script. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's okay. It's good. I love it's all good. these stories. Very good. It's like a bonus story that we didn't count on. So thank you. <laughs> I want to go into storytelling though. Um, detailed research, pointing attention to the smallest aspect of a scene seem incredibly critical to the immersion into the story for the audience. How important do you see those key aspects to storytelling? Make or break. Well, um, I think that, uh, this all this concept that you're discussing revolves around the idea of suspension of disbelief, mm -hmm. which is a term we've all heard and used, but it's so important because if the audience is ever going to really be immersed in the story, then they have to suspend disbelief because some of the stories we feed them are pretty fantastic you know, and pretty mm -hmm. unbelievable. You know? mm -hmm. And yet we want them to believe it and we want them to suspend their disbelief. And the only way that's going to happen is that's another one of our pillars, which is connectivity and, and continuity. If all the bits and pieces and parts of the world we're building uh, are convincing, are harmonious, are fit together, that we can we can really begin to believe. Uh, and this comes back to this phrase we've used over and over again, eliminating any contradictions that violate and, and then begin to, to weaken suspension of disbelief. And so that's why the detail is so important because we want our audience to really immerse themselves into the worlds that we're building, into those worlds that are home to the stories we're trying to tell. Love that. I absolutely love that. That's, that's so important. So important. Uh, I want to, I want to go back to something you touched about Ray Bad Bradbury a little bit ago, and there's a lot of people that don't know how important he was to the aspect and, and when he came in for support with the, uh, what you all were building. So future world, uh, you know, it was a creative production that eventually became spaceship earth. Can you talk for a moment about the evolution from the start to the inclusion of Ray Badbury, the importance of Ray, uh, to the ultimate completion of this iconic monument? Yes, we, we sort of touched on that a bit. When I first was assigned the project, uh, we, Marty said, well, let, what is our perisphere? What is our 1939 perisphere, you know? Uh, and we call it a, a future world theater was the, was, the, was the working concept name. And uh, we had no idea at that point it was going to be a dome or a geodesic or that. Uh, but we did know that we were trying to tell the story of uh, the, the emergence of these these environments, cities uh, that people lived in, 
And uh, so we were focusing on that. And and then when Ray entered the scene, he came came along and said, well, you know, you guys, before we can talk about the future, let's talk about the past. Let's talk about how we got here. You know? uh, and that's when we began to develop the idea. Uh, he wrote a first little treatment of, of how it all started, that first painting on the first cave wall. Uh, and it, it became an issue of survival, but primarily of communications. Uh, why were they scratching on that wall? Why were they painting bison? Why were they, you know, trying to tell stories at that early, early time? And then we continued to progress through history, showing how those images evolved with the Egyptians into words and into language and into theater with the Greeks and so on and so forth, right on up to this idea that survival uh, in education uh, requires communication and requires uh, that we tell these stories. And that was, that was Ray's great contribution, I think. And Ray was one, is, is, was one of the, uh, our relation, my relationship with Ray went on for years after I let, left uh, Disney. He would always come up to my studio on Saturdays in, in his Beverly Hills taxi cab because he didn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd sit, yeah, we'd sit around and talk. But his, I think one of his significant contributions to this whole evolutionary cycle that we've been talking about tonight, uh, audience immersion, uh, when he wrote The Illustrated Man and, and he had his, his, the children, you know, and the, and the family going off to Africa in this, in this time machine. Uh, so this time machine idea has been, been at work in, in, in authorship for, for quite some time. Uh, Alice in Wonderland walking through the looking glass, going into C.S. Lewis and the Narnia, uh, going into these different worlds. And I think, I think Ray was a great contributor to that idea of the proscenium, you know, the notion that you, you separate the fantasy world from the real world that you're in. Love and it. yet this audience, audience immersion idea is sort of breaking down that proscenium. When Alice goes into the looking glass, you know, she's going into that other world. And um, there's been a, several movies, uh, uh, Woody Allen, uh, Purple Rose of Cairo, you know, where they're coming in and off the screen. And even before that, uh, Sherlock Jr., I think, with uh, Buster Keaton, um, he was a projectionist and moving in and off the screen. Mm -hmm. So. This idea of, and Walt's contribution of pouring his audience into the story uh, is all part of this idea of audience That's immersion. It. Yep, absolutely. Cool. I, I wanted to jump in for one second because I saw a question in the chat that I wanted to highlight. I thought it was a good question. It's from It's Me, David T. And he asks, what are your thoughts on the current spaceship Earth with the new points of light added to it? Hmm. I, th I thought it visually was very dramatic and I enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, I think it was a, a, anything to enhance the icon. And I think it really brought the icon mm -hmm. to life. I, and, you know, I was very, very pleased with it and very encouraged that kind of evolution. Um, so. Cool. Awesome. That's, that's great. Um, I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about your dad. Let's talk about John Sr. for a little bit. Oh, do we have um, he to? was a, <laughs> just a little okay just a little okay so he, he was a legendary art director and production designer he earned 11 oscar nominations and won three of them for the king and i cleopatra and hello dolly in disney wow. history he was the art director for hall of presidents and consulted extensively for Epcot Space Pavilion and Energy. He also painted two favorites, the Diamond Horseshoe Backdrop and the Burden of War. Can you share with our viewers the impact your father had on your life and your career? Oh, not much. Um, <laughs> no, as we said earlier, I am the poster boy of nepotism. And, and I was so fortunate to, to grow up, uh, you know, under his tutelage. He was my father, my teacher. Um, I have a little book I'm going to publish it's called Traveling with Dad, Travels with Dad. And we went around the world together. And he, he, uh, he had this strange idea that he wanted to keep his family with him wherever he went, which was sort of frowned on in the early days of motion pictures. You know, you went on location, you went off, left your family at home. Not dad, he took us with us wherever he went. So uh, 
some, when we have another hour sometime, I'd, I'd love to elaborate on it. John, I will just say that one of his extremely uh, amazing abilities was what the, I believe the neuroscientists call it hyperphantasia. Okay. And it, we're fanta- we're, aphantasia is the lack of, of good memory. Hyperphantasia is, is the ability to mentally record images and do it in a way that uh, you can almost complete. He could complete the drawing in his head before he'd drawn it. And so he was almost like a laser printer when he picked a pencil up. He'd already finished the drawing in his mind. I know that sounds a bit extreme, but most of us have to struggle and make overlays and underlays and work and work and work. Not this man. He, he really, and sometime when we have more time, I'll, I'll go through the kinds of stories about how that was possible. And, and uh, I'm kind of anxious to publish the book Travels with Dad because it does kind of explain uh, this unique talent he had. Of, and it's part of what we talked about earlier, Imagineering. It's the front end of it. It's how do you get the idea out of your head and onto a piece of paper so it can be discussed, modeled, communicated, and eventually built. Uh, many times the artist will cycle that. He'll, he'll draw the apple and then draw it again. And uh, pretty soon it gets pretty, it starts turning into a pretty good apple. That can all happen in your mind. And then when you draw it, it's almost perfect to the first yeah. iteration. And there are some other artists in the world I've seen that could do this. I think Leonardo used to do that quite well, uh, but that's for another night to get into. That. We but definitely it, want we um, definitely want you to come back, especially as that book gets together, and we'll definitely do another night. But I love hearing about this. Yeah, let's, let's do a night on John Cena because because he was he's far too far too prolific and and, and accomplished too many things to do. We will, definitely, we will definitely do that a John Senior night. I would love that, and I'm sure I can Thank talk. I'm sure I can talk to Boston to it, uh, so uh, we could do that. So yeah, she's already not, so we're good. Okay, uh, let's good. let's jump over for a second here, and uh, I'd be I'd be uh, probably um, hung at the stake outside my house if I didn't bring up a little. There's this little movie. I don't know if anybody's heard about it. Uh, it's about ghosts. It's about Busting. I think it's called Ghostbusters. Uh, I want to highlight that for a minute. With your father as the production designer and you as the art director, you set a precedence for father-son excellence in project design. An important note that Ghostbusters is largely admired for the presence and even character of the main building, 55 Central Park West, designed by you and your father. And I want to note, credited by, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm about to say this, credited by Dan Aykroyd and Ivan Reitman as the most impactful part of the movie story. Please take a moment and just talk about Ghostbusters, that iconic scene, your time on the set. I I am just want to sit back and take it all in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, it was, I think, uh, a moment in filmmaking that it was somewhat unique on a very personal level. I don't know how many father and son teams ever got credit on a movie before, but that's kind of interesting. That's but true. more to the point, more to your point, the, I think the core uh, icon of, of the film in, in terms of world building again, was this building of Spook Central that uh, really became, as, as we mentioned earlier, became a character in the movie itself. And then you, you get into this area of how do you create that sort of a character. And it, you'll find that the pieces and parts of how we put Ghost Central, Spook Central together, were born out of the protagonists in, in the story. I mean, Dana's apartment was locked into it. Uh, the, the terror dogs were locked into it. All of these pieces then sort of found a home in this, in this building. And, and the building, of course, never existed in, in its entirety. The lower half of it uh, was in Central Park West, as you suggest. Uh, but the ground floor uh, was copied and built at Warner Brothers back lot, the eruption sequence, because for some reason, the New York Police Department didn't want us to tear up uh, the street. I, won- I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. We did bring we did bring fiberglass pieces of the ruptured street and set them out there early in the morning. And apparently the New York uh, switch were lit up because all the old little, little ladies that were going to walk their dog really thought the street had erupted that day. And uh, so that was, that was a moment in reality. But the center section of the building was a miniature. Hats off to Richard Lunn and his special effects work. And then the top of the building was the big set on stage 16 that we built where the gateway to, to, to Gozier's world. Uh, 
so yes, it was quite an experience, and I, I always enjoy it because it never existed anywhere. You know, it was it was something we created through the use of, and not super special effects in terms of the, today's computer technology. We were just on the brink of that. And Richard used mm -hmm. a, a good deal of, of digital uh, assist in that, but still, it was a, there was a lot of old world special effects in there, match shots and miniatures, and, and so on and so forth. But I think the the charm of it was that. It existed in the film and nowhere else in the world. Absolutely. And, and, and an incredible movie. And, and, you know, it just keeps coming back in multiple different variations. We've had the ladies that were doing it. We had the most recent effort and now out now, which is doing phenomenal is bringing back the, a lot of the original cast. And, and that's a true testament to the efforts of you and your dad and everyone else who worked on that initial one uh, to keep it going. Of course, Ivan Reitman's son, who is now taken over in his father's footsteps, uh, just mm -hmm. iconic how the father son uh, tandem there works very well on that movie. Uh, so. yeah, well, hats, hats, hats off to Jason. He's a, he's a brilliant young man. And uh, yeah, another father son team. So it's that's great. Incredible. <laughs> Jen? You know, um, all throughout the evening, our mobs have been dropping the links for a lot of um, John's projects that he's worked on. And one of the links um, that you'll see in there, um, we're going to talk about that now, uh, the John DeCure Production Design Study Center at Asbury University. That's a mouthful. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it features the John DeCure collection of over 400 original set design paintings, over 1,200 sketches, and part of the library of books that inspired you and your father details for your eight decade production design careers. The DeCure collection includes production design artwork from over 50 films. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, had to, I had to read that. I didn't want to miss any of that. What does it mean to you knowing that the incredible talents of you and your father will be viewed by many long after your time on earth is complete? Well, we're, I'm very proud of the people at Asbury who have generously extended us the opportunity to, to curate and, and to keep the work together. My father had a, actually had a strange habit. He, but one of the things that started happening in the studio system was that the studios had was very disrespectful of the artwork that was created to make their films, and they they, they would they would, the trash trucks would pull up, you know. Uh, and my father had a very uh, he he really felt his work was pretty good, <laughs> and so he started saving all of his work at a very young age. I have sketches that he made going way back to the 1930s in Universal. Uh, and so only because of his, uh, uh, I guess, love, pride in his own work, whatever, do we have this collection. And it's an interesting collection of, of the evolution of a man's life, uh, especially a man with the kind of talent he had. Um, so I think it, it, it's going to offer young people a great learning opportunity to come in and, and look at this work, these, these moments in time that progressed from the very, very early days of, of Matt Shot special effects technology uh, all the way up to uh, computer-driven machinery that he was designing, you know, for films like Star Wars and I mean, uh, 2001, etc. So it's a. I'm very, very pleased that that we have an opportunity to open to young minds this particular segment of world building uh, for purposes of storytelling and education uh, that will help us. Uh, uh, encourage young people to move forward and do even better things in the future. Absolutely. I love that you're being honored that way. And definitely uh, this is a, a situation that is not just a given. This was earned with what you all have done. It's those numbers that Jen just read are, are just mind blowing. And uh, I, I'm just blown away. Uh, it, I guess it's a great uh, transition to, to kind of where I want to go with one of my uh, close thoughts here is as we're going out, John, you know, your career is remarkable. Uh, your dad's is incredible and, and we'll be blessed to get a night to talk about him in the future. And I definitely want to do that. Um, you know, honestly, from our eyes, and I speak for Jen and I both on this, uh, we, we both feel it's warranted that your, your name should be listed in the legends and the Imagineer acknowledgements by so many. You have worked on projects with names like Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, Tom Hanks, Dan Aykroyd, and Tom Cruise, just to name a few. 
What has it meant to you to see you and your father's name synonymous with iconic projects and actors from Cleopatra to Ghostbusters crossing so many decades of entertainment in the world of Disney and beyond? Are there any, and are there any stories from your interactions that you might want to share? Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, yeah, I think that uh, I am proud of some unique situations. I, I am probably the first uh, six-year-old ever to go to jail with Burt Lancaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as a toddler, literally, I was uh, on the set of Naked City, and Burt took me in his cell, and walked me up to the tower, and and uh, we uh, we pointed that big machine gun down in the in the in the courtyard. Um, and lots of fun stories and travels with that along that line. Uh, Tyrone Power and I uh, crawled around on the back of a train at, uh, in Diplomatic Courier. And my whole young life was, was sort of uh, surrounded by uh, some great stars and some great people. Uh, and I, I always, I always well, the memories I pull from that too, though, were that these were great talents. Uh, but basically inside they were good people you know? mm -hmm. and they really cared and they really cared about, I remember Sir Carol Reed once said to me sitting on the steps of, uh, of the uh, Pope's palace that we were building in Carrara. And he said, Oh, so what are you going to do? You're going to follow in your father's footsteps. You're going to follow in mine. Sir Carol Reed was knighted. He was a, a director of, of great fame. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he said, well, if you ever change your mind and you want to follow in my footsteps, I'll give you a little advice. He said, be sure your first movie is an adventure comedy. And I said, yeah, why? He said, well, if it's an adventure comedy, uh, they won't get up and leave till the end. Uh, they have to see who did it. And he said, if it's a comedy, the critics won't know whether they're laughing at you or laughing at the movie. And so that, that was his that was just it. But anyway, the little stories, you know, like that, and, and just wonderful people, always concerned and always anxious to to share their talent with you. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, I love it, Jen. Um, I I noticed a um, another question in the chat that I wanted okay. to highlight. Yes, sure. Um, Mike Wheeler asks, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that wants to inspire to be an Imagineer? and the key things that they need to take in to be the best they can? Well, of course, there are many phases there of Imagineering, from writing to producing. But if we get back and, and focus in on the designing side of it, um, you know, drawing becomes an essential, essential part of design. Being able to model these imagine the, your ideas and put them on a piece of paper and present them to someone uh, is really core. And uh, we, I don't think our academic system does drawing justice. Uh, you know, we stop kind of patting our children on the back at about in third grade. And, uh, you know, we take down our, their wonderful drawings from our refrigerators. And then we never even talk about their ability to draw. You know, I have college graduate students that can barely draw stick figures. Now you can say, well, that's okay. You know, people don't need to be artists. And, and, and yet there is something that's happening in terms of ideas moving from your mind to a piece of paper. So I encourage daily journaling. I encourage scribbling. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to go out and take art classes to learn how to, how to draw. But I really encourage you to create a design journal where you put your thoughts down you know, in that journal. And more than just words, not a word diary. A few words are okay here and there. But just scribble, draw. Take the, try to create the images, take the images out of your mind and put them on a piece of paper. And I think if you, you, if you get, and it's difficult, it's hard. It's like learning how to be a great tennis player or, or, or a baseball player or a golf player. You have to practice at it every day to be good at it. Uh, so practice in that area. If you really have intentions to become an Imagineer, become a, a, a production designer of sorts, project designer, work on that work on getting those ideas out of your mind and onto a piece of paper your drawings will be horrible at first but don't don't let that dissuade you just keep at it just imagine uh, you know tiger woods when he was six years old and <laughs> trying to get that little white ball in the hole he had to practice he, every day you know to get as good as he is and and the same with my father he was a great illustrator a great uh, man with a pencil in his hand 
but it didn't stop. It didn't. It didn't come easily. He he worked for years uh, to to uh, to get that expertise up to that level. So you don't have to be brilliant at drawing, but you do have to be good at getting your ideas out of your head and onto a piece of paper. Okay. So cool. Work with it. Yeah. Good. Well, tonight has been amazing to talk with John, learning about the impact he and his family has made on the world of Disney and the cinematic culture. If you have any questions that were not covered tonight for John, please leave them in the comment section of the video, and we'll be sure that he has a chance to respond to them. Absolutely. And of course, we'll, we'll work to set up a night where we celebrate uh, John DeCure Sr. And, and ask John uh, to come back with us and to talk a little bit about more on his dad and extensively on on what that is for sure 100 percent want to remind everybody to please uh leave a like on the video it also helps if you haven't subscribed to the channel make sure you do uh before we go to our final thought i want to remind everybody that coming up in just two weeks on april the second we uh not only are we honoring honoring animators and artists and authors on this channel we're also jen and i trying to dig in to some of the uniquest concepts we can find in social media and coming up on that week, we will sit down with Hot Dogs at Disney, a social media content creator that is finding new ways to find the magic outside of the norm. And I think that's going to be the fantastic. That will be April the 2nd that we'll be sitting down. Uh, we also should note out uh, that we'll be sitting with somebody that uh, John knows very well in the near future. Coming up will be Chris Crump on this channel, which will be Raleigh Crump's uh, son that will sit down and talk about Raleigh and another father-son duo doing it. Uh, John, I know you know them both very well. Great, great, great designers and, and wonderful people. Yeah. It's going to be a good time to talk about that. Well, as we pull the train into the station here, as Walt likes to do, is he used to ride the uh, train all around the park. We try to do the same thing. And by doing so, we say, hey, it's your turn for a final thought of the night. Uh, we always go to our guests first. So, John, I'll turn it over to you for your final thought of the night. Well, we just parted on this notion. If you, if you have any ambitions to get into uh, the Imagineering world, uh, draw and draw and draw more. Uh, I would say that. And also, I think that uh, our academic systems need to take a closer look at storytelling and communications and the process. That's why I'm so pleased with Asbury University that they've taken time to consider that as as an, an important element um the you know education is 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 driven by our ability to communicate and communicate well and the core of all of that is storytelling and that's what may has made wed and wdi and, and disney uh, so successful mm -hmm. is that they are master storytellers so think about that and think about that in terms of education because most of Oh, our books and the Bibles and whatever are parables. They're stories that educate, that hope to educate us to living. And the final statement will be Walt's dream, better ways of living. Let us Love produce that. and develop better ways of living. Love that. Love that. Jen, wow. final thought for you. Um, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for spending the evening with us and sharing your wonderful stories. I want to thank your son, John, Spaceship Ears, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. opening the door for us that we could have this conversation. Uh, I look forward to sitting down with you again in the future. Talk about your book. I hope you'd be up for sitting down with us to talk about that. So that would be great. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming into the chat, um, for your wonderful questions, comments heartwarming. Um, it, it was just such a wonderful evening. And, and I'm just so blessed that I had this opportunity. So thank you, everyone. Well said, well said. Highlighting real quick, uh, a couple quick things I saw in here. Winks Wild Ride said, great show, Pete and Jen, amazing guest. Mr. DeCure, highly educated and well-spoken. Uh, Rob, aka Mr. Disney M, watching from the UK at, I don't know, two in the morning over there right now, watching the interview. <laughs> thank you, watching that late. So fascinating of an interview. Uh, Anne Marie Dreyer said, John, thank you so much for your time tonight. And for uh, where you go, it jumped on me. Uh, where'd you go? Anne Marie, thank you so much for your time tonight. And thank you for sharing your all of your talent with us. Wendy B, thank you, Pete Molly, Mr. DeCure, for this. This is awesome. I will replay from the beginning that I missed Spaceship Ears. It was cool. It was as cool as I thought it would be. Um, Movie Mania <laughs> Nick says, This was a great interview. It's a pleasure to hear all the wonderful stories Mr. DeCure had to say. 
um, uh, Hitchhiking Bones, who I will be live on Hitchhiking Bones later tonight at 10 o'clock on the East Coast time as a guest over there, said, uh, thank you so much for the great uh, conversation. And let's see, one or two more. Debbie Bernfeld said she's hitting up the emojis saying to, uh, to a very impressive interview and a very talented family of John DeCure, just pure amazing. Uh, this is awesome to see. Mike Tao says, this is so awesome. Thank you, Mr. DeCure, for all your work you've done to make the world a magical place. Bit, the, the comments just keep coming, John. Bitritz says, been so amazing. I, I will need to watch this replay for sure. I love it that so many people are doing that. I'm going to throw uh, one more curveball. We've had two. I'm going to throw a third one. Uh, I hope I hope I don't get in trouble with the boss. Uh, I got to ask this question. You probably get asked this a bunch, uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You knew so many people that surrounded Walt. You worked with these people. You got to be a part of their life. You got to hear about Walt and, and really learn the in-depth thoughts of Walt through so many incredibly talented individuals. What do you think, based on that, if you have a thought, that Walt would think about Epcot now? His original plans for a future world of tomorrow obviously changed and adjusted when his brother came in, when Roy came in and, and continued to keep the, uh, the, the passion and the love that Walt wanted to do alive. Do you think that if, if, we, if you and Molly and I could take a walk, take a walk around World Showcase with Walt, that, that it would put a smile on his face? I think the fact that it exi that his dream was emerging and happening and growing would put a big smile on his face. Uh, I don't think that he'd want to draw a line in the sand and say, this is it, and here's what's right and here's what's wrong with it. Right. I, think, I think he'd be looking far into the next steps. He was always one step ahead of all of us. And uh, so I think he, uh, he would, uh, he would uh, maybe uh, kick a few stones down the road here and there. But I think his focus would be totally on on the future and how do we take how do we take what we've got here and how do we improve it and and move it towards his original concept, which was a prototype community of tomorrow, not necessarily a brick and mortar solution, but a way in which we can design better ways of living uh, using our latest technologies and virtual realities. Uh, yeah, I think I think he would he would jump in, roll up his sleeves, and go to work. I love that. Well, it's it's been our honor to sit here with you tonight and listen to the stories. And uh, again, so talented you and your dad uh, are and deserve so much of the respect that you're getting. And I love the chat is doing that. want to encourage everybody to head on over to Big Fat Panda. He's another great interview tonight. Again, I'll be live later tonight on the Hitchhiking Bones at, at 10 o'clock. I think the best way that I can finish this, and John, I'll ask you to hang backstage for a sec as we finish it, is the best compliment that I could give you right now, John, on behalf of us is I think if we were doing that walk around Epcot, I think Walt would turn to you in front of us and say, John, I like all the things. I like all the things. I think that's a great compliment because we all know how much that terminology meant to Walt. It's been our honor to sit with John DeCure Jr. here tonight. So amazing, so talented. If you've had a good time and you've watched this interview, leave a comment in the chat. Leave a question for John if you have it. We'll work to bring him back at a little bit later date. And don't forget, we have more incredible concept creators, Disney Dialogues with the Magic Makers, Monorail Molly, and Pete sitting with you on Tuesday nights coming in the future. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining.